one of these and you're over here. Which brew is that? It's the art car on cast with Meyer lemon and lemon drop hops. Yeah. It's a lemony lemon lemon. <laughs> it's a lemony lemon lemon. Lemony lemon lemon lemon. <laughs> Come on in, everybody. Oh, you guys, it smells really cool. So we have not sold out to the man in order to ever plan on doing it. 
great elevators, which you may have seen the blue pipes outside the far window over there where it was the photo booth. They go from the floor to the ceiling, those run through the building on a loop track. And they have a chain being pulled through them. And on that chain, separated by a few inches, there's some small discs. It passes by an opening in the grain room, and the ball falls between those gaps, and we pull it from the first floor all the way up to the third floor in the mill room. And we'll crush that beer ball through the mill. We send it down this chute over here into our mash kettle. So we mash in, we're mixing it with 165 degree Fahrenheit, good hot water. Um, we allow those sugars to convert from long, complex carbohydrate strains into short, simple sugar chains. It takes about an hour to retain. Uh, if we didn't do that, the yeast would not be able to break down the complex carbohydrates. So you'd just be left with uh, carbonation free, alcohol free bread juice, basically, <laughs> which would be yeah. weird. Uh, I would still probably drink some, but not nearly the healthy diet that I prefer. Um, so, anyway, we've got the trainers right here the louder. So, the louder is a, kind of a large moving top or a strainer. Um, it's going to remove that cement grain for us. We pump that to the silos at the back of the building. And we hold it there where a pig farmer buys our spent grain from us uh, twice a week. So he feeds that to his fat and delicious pigs, which are extra delicious because they are fueled by beer. You know what? Cheers being fueled by beer. Cheers! Yeah. <laughs> That's some inception level shit right there, right? Cheers <laughs> being, being fueled by beer while fueling yourself with beer. I know. Uh, Anyway, and then actually we skip this unit temporarily. We go down to the end of the boil kettle, where we actually cook the beer. We raise it to a boiling temperature. We're going to cook it for about an hour, give or take, depending on the recipe. Um, and then also these canisters here, they're currently closed with little knobby handling dudes on them. Um, those we stage pots in, and we flush that into the boil for bittering, flavoring, and uh, Then we transfer that hot water over here. And uh, this is the Whirlpool. It'll sit or fuse that liquid, collect any hot material or other remaining solid particles that may have missed. Um, and we remove that prior to fermentation. It will pass it through an inline temperature converter out to the tank farm where we have live yeast culture waiting. We pitch that yeast about 70 degrees if it's an ale, much cooler if it's a lager. Um, and then we let it go from there, right? Um, we'll go downstairs now. And talk about finishing the fermentation process, why we call ourselves a uh, a few other tidbits, and you guys can take pictures and ask me any questions you have. Right. Let's roll. <laughs> He's talking to the camera, y'all. This is insane. Did you hear the history of it? The facility in itself is 100 years old. And in Houston, particularly um, Harris County, a lot of it is just zone free. So for them to have been in this facility as long as they have, that's a huge economical and, and business accomplishment. All right, let's carry on. Oh shit, it's hot. <laughs> oh, <wait a> <laughs> For 4th of July, I'll more than likely be eating barbecue with my family, but we'll experience that tomorrow. Stairs. Look at this huge fan. We live. Bop, bop, boo. <gasps> Time to sing some karaoke, people. Oh, yeah. Will you be my backup singer? What do you got? Oh, yeah. He's on fire. <laughs> this guy is in fuego. All right. We're going to do this. Can you guys hear me up there with the baby battleship? Heck, yeah. All right. When we left off the stairs, we were sitting in that delicious ward down here, thrown in with some yeast. And that's where the real magic happens. 
Everybody thinks that like the brewing process itself, you know, is where you're making beer. You know, for, you're putting the building blocks together for sure. But the real magic happens when you start fermenting. Uh, now, lagers are going to move at a much slower temperature. They're bottom feeding, cooler temperature yeasts. Um, they're going to operate in like the high 30s. Um, so sometimes low 40s, depending on the strain, but they take anywhere from five to eight weeks to make. So if you're enjoying, you know, the summer pills today, or the five o'clock pills there, uh, those are true lagers, and they take almost eight weeks of peace to make. So lager in German means to cellar or to store. So when you make a lager, you have your initial primary fermentation, but then lager yeast put out a lot of like sulfates and some minor off flavors, where if you rush that beer, try and bottle up, package it, or get it to market before it's ready, or it's properly lagered, it will smell or taste kind of funky or sulfury, right? So if somebody's making a really cheap lager and just pumping it out there, you'd probably be encouraged to drink it like as cold as possible, or with lots of salts, or fruit, or as cold as possible with salt and fruit. Because all of those things, low temperatures, salt, and acidic fruit, mask the off flavors of cheaply produced lagers. But anyway, um, they can enhance the flavors too. But uh, here, we let our lagers go the full extent, right? The cool thing about lagering beer is that those uh, minor off flavors will break up and break down and dissipate and absorb back into the beer over time. So what you're left with is a very crisp uh, finish, whether it's light or dark, and usually a little higher degree of clarity. So lagers are awesome if you got the time to make it. Uh, ales, conversely, are pretty quick, uh, little, pretty quick little bunnies at consuming that sugar, shooting out CO2 and alcohol. Uh, it takes about three to five days for a lot of ales uh, to, to fully attenuate the sugar out of those beers. So, you know, some of our longer ales may be seven days, but they're pretty quick. Actually, if they move too quick, you have to do what's called crashing the beer. So sometimes. You put yeast in there, and the yeast is like, it's time to party! It starts going nuts. But if it consumes it too fast, it will make your beer taste like a loaf of like fruit bread. It gets really sweet because ale yeast put off fruity esters as they churn through that sugar. So if it goes too quick, uh, we'll crash it. You drop down like 30, 32 degrees, you just stop the yeast production. For the most part, we have the recipes down really well before it gets to this format production. I mean, when you're talking about 240 barrels, you know, uh, a barrel of beer is the same as a barrel of oil. It's an oil town, so a lot of people associate barrelage with oil. Uh, but beer is actually considered in the 40s, it's in the 30s. So if you look behind us over here, this is our test brew system. Made little small baby batches on sometimes. Um, that's made out of keg shells. You may recognize them from high school or college when you held on to them upside down while people scream numbers at you in sequential order. Um, <laughs> both half gallons of pop, so a barrel of beer is two of them. So if we have 240 barrels of beer times 31 gallons times 128 ounces in a gallon divided by 12 fluid ounces, off the top of your head, real quick, how many 12 ounce beers fit in this fermenter? A lot. Three or four? Three or four. <laughs> Very large beers, that is correct. <laughs> wow. That would be like a 60 barrel beer, which would kill five of you. Um, <laughs> uh, so there are a little over 79,000 individual cans or bottles in just one of these 240 barrel fermenters. So clearly we want to keep all of that product nice and safe. That's why these are jacketed, you know, they're, they're temperature control. We use a glycol cooling system to kind of make sure we regulate that at the proper temperature, whether we're even lagering or, or making the hills. Um, but it's also why this area out here is not temperature controlled. So like today, we're not in production. We got the big ass fan going. Weather's not that bad. By the way, I'm not cursing necessarily the brand name of that fan, but actually a big ass fan, so you can go look. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the summer's I think get 115, 120 degrees in here on the hotter days, especially when we're rolling full steam. So the brewers, they'll sweat off probably like 15, 20 pounds through the summer. Um, and then they also have to endure the frigid Houston winters uh, from January 6th 
all the way through January 8th, it gets <laughs> below 50, which is pretty cool from what I understand. Um, <laughs> shut the school system down, it's below 50. Um, anyway, other things I've noted here, we off track a little bit, uh, the names, we had, to, we, had to, we had to label all the tanks, so instead of being like tank one, tank two, tank three, I and they were a lot. Uh, we went with uh, saint names to kind of stick with the theme. Also, if you're up to date on your uh, saint lore, you'll notice that they are fake saint names. Saint Sampa Meister, for example, not a real saint. In case that didn't clue you in. Um, we named them after past or current employees, investors, uh, people that helped us get our start in the industry in the early 90s. Um, if you make it up on the side of a stainless steel tank, you kind of live on in infamy in the brewery. Uh, unless we outgrow it. We generally will never get rid of stainless unless we get too, too big for that size. That's the ghost of the brewery. It's just going to kill all of us. It's fine. We're going down together, just like on the Titanic. It'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> other cool things to note. Our, over here we have our RO water. RO stands for reverse osmosis. Um, so we, what does that mean? You may be asking yourself. Well, RO water is... Uh, has been distilled, it has no salination, no minerality, no flavor to it. So that means that we build our beers from the ground up for our water profile. Now some places around the world, they will stake their claim on the flavor of their water. Like if you go have, uh, you know, Munich style Helles in Germany, the particular minerality of their water gives all their beers a very pleasant, distinct flavor that naturally you can't emulate anywhere else. Uh, we could have done that here in Houston too. You know, we originally we were just going to go draw buckets straight from Buffalo Bayou, oh, God. bring those over, and just make all brown ales. It would have been pretty easy, right? <laughs> we're stouts, depending on the time of year. Um, <laughs> but instead, we decided to go with our own water, starting with Alyssa, um, and that gives us kind of a chameleon ability. We could, because we're starting basic ground zero, we can add in the minerals and salts and compounds. See you Northwest or you know wherever we can do that or sometimes we'll say hey you know this beer we really like this hop and we want to highlight the flavor of this more than them all you know we can tweak the salts to kind of to, to do that as well so it gives us a lot of flexibility with all of our beer our uh, beer recipes so. uh, and the last thing we'll talk about and then I'll let you guys snap some pictures and ask questions if you care to is why we call ourselves St. Arnold um, so our owner was inspired by the legend of St. Arnold. He had a, a number of stories uh, associated with his legend. He's the patron saint of brewers, by the way, that existed in the Middle Ages, and that's France. Um, one of the stories that's associated with him is, you know, after posthumously, his people, his followers, were going to gather his remains and walk them back to his hometown. Everything was by foot back then, unless you're super rich. Um, and during this long and arduous task, they stopped in an inn to rest. And they said, hey, you know, we want to get a, we want to get beers and raise them in honor of our fallen friend, St. Arnold, the patron saint of brewers. And the innkeeper said, well, you know, I'd love to, but I've, I've got wine, but I've really only got one mug of beer left, according to the legend. And he said, well, that's fine. We'll just, we'll take it. We'll take really small sips and we'll say nice things about St. Arnold and pass it around. So they took these small sips of their beer pass it around, and as the legend of the miracle goes, the beer never ran fully empty until everyone had their fill, right? So either it was a miracle beer, or somebody was spiking their drink, I don't know which one is true, but everybody got jumped up real nice before the mug ran dry. Uh, so the idea behind it is, if you are in good favor with St. Arnold, your beer will never run dry of high quality, independently produced, all natural and healthy for you, right? St. Arnold beer. So, cheers to you guys. Cheers. And independently owned craft breweries everywhere. Told you, small sips. Hey man, you got a power beer.